Hello everybody, good evening and uh, welcome to the last show of our Wakonze coverage. Uh, today we didn't have as much at stake as we have normally in the last round of a tournament because Fabiano Caruana had secured the tournament victory already, leading by a full point and a half. But he decided to go out in style today and won one more game. So I think that was four wins in a row for Fabiano to end this tournament. Finished with a huge score. And I have the cross table here, which I will push. Give me one second. Actually, I thought I had it loaded up. Give me one second here. Oh, here we go. All right, so this is a cross table at the very end of the tournament. Fabiano with a huge plus seven score. It's, it's rare that you see someone win a tournament with plus seven, but uh, it happened here. Uh, no losses, uh, seven wins, six draws. Magnus Carlsen, two points back with eight out of 13. Uh, not a bad tournament, but you can see in the, the uh, if you look at the live ratings, uh, you know, of, uh, that, that um, are updated, uh, you know, as, as they play. Fabiano was winning uh, just shy of 20 points, I think 19 and a half or something like that, bringing him up to 28.41 while Magnus is losing about 9 or 10 points. So he uh, goes down to about, um, you know, only about a 20-point gap between the two, which is the narrowest that we've seen between Magnus and anybody in quite a while. Then uh, after that in the standings, I, I did want to kind of run down through through the different players and, and tell you what I thought. You know, Wesley So had a really solid tournament, but he just uh, he just didn't seem to have it in him to really push, uh, especially as the end got near and maybe he felt like he didn't really have chances to to win the event. Um, he you know he did well, but uh, but yeah, just two wins and you know it felt like he wasn't really in trouble in most of his games and just you know kind of coasted through solidly. Uh, might have been nice to see a little bit more out of him. Uh, Van Forest had a super tournament, just kind of a breakaway tournament, you could call. You know, he won a number of games. He had done fairly well last year, but this is a whole other level. Uh, today, we'll look at his game briefly because he was playing for the Dutch supremacy, you know, in, in this event anyway, uh, between Anish Giri and, and him. And so he finished as a top Dutchman, even though he was lower rated by about 100, some 120 points or so. Um, now, Dubov, I actually thought, had... A very good tournament because he was kind of a I feel like he didn't exploit all of his chances uh, for example you know in the game again against Anish Giri he was almost winning out of the opening and then just played kind of carelessly and drew uh, but you know he did solidly he had some good games with black he did lose a couple uh, but he won some games and played I thought he played pretty inspiredly and so uh, you know I thought it was a good tournament for him after that the next several guys I mean kind of average for both Anand and Duda Ferruja, um, it's a deceptive score because he was actually leading, um, I think, after seven or maybe even eighth rounds, he was still still tied for first. So pretty solid showing for him, having won four games early, and then he went through you know, a rough, rough patch, but finished today with a draw. Anish Giri, you know, people make fun of him for all the draws today. Another draw and a tournament that was not really an exception, although he did win one and lose one. and so. Uh, but I think he probably felt a little bit disappointed. Um, and then, you know... As we go down, all the remaining players I think would be fairly disappointed. In particular, Vitugov, who's had you know some really good results. His rating has gone up, but in this tournament, he really struggled. I don't think he really had a lot of winning chances in in most of his games, and so and Kovalyov had a really kind of bad tournament. Just got outplayed by by a lot of by a lot of players. So um, so going back, I'm going to go back to uh, sh showing my face here. Uh, we're going to quickly go through today's games um, because you know I think they, they were worth there were some moments worth seeing uh, in particular Fabiano his game was uh, another another sort of typical Fabiano game good preparation um, we'll get the moves I'll get started with the moves here um, good preparation Artemiev is sort of a sort of a weird player with white not the most ambitious and he plays a lot of setups with g3 and b3 um, but here Fabiano transposes into a line of the English that's featured, you know, among other things in like the Mihail Marin uh, book on the English opening. Um, and this I've always thought is a good, is a very good solid line for black. Um, you know, white plays the English way, so they, they don't try to go for a Catalan type position by playing D4, but they play with D3. Uh, it just, it just seems like a very solid uh, variation for black. This is all theory. Um, and now there's a few ways to play, and I actually don't, I don't love um, 
the way that Artemiev plays in this game. I'll, I'll show you why. So he takes, takes. All this has been played like dozens of times. Uh, the move bishop g5, I'm just, I'm just not a big fan of. It's, uh, it's basically saying that you're, you've got nothing better than, than going here and trading the bishop for the knight fairly soon. Uh, and it's just hard to believe that white will ever be better here. You know, black essentially has more space. All of their pieces are developed. Arguably, the b5 pawn is a little bit weak, but you know, it can always be protected by bishop c6. It's just, it just really seems like a kind of an insipid way to play for white. Um, you know, I think more sharp. Um, you can try to play, first of all, you don't have to play a4 with white, but you can also try plans with e2, e4, um, usually, usually putting the bishop on b2 and eventually trying to play uh, for d3, d4. I think those are at least, you know, somewhat ambitious. Um, but the plan in this game, bishop g5, really seems like maybe Artemia was just thought that this game would end in a draw because Fabiano didn't need to, he didn't have anything at stake and maybe he was happy to go home, you know, with... Uh, with obviously a tournament win, and he even said yesterday in the interview that he wasn't uh, he wasn't feeling physically well, like that he was he had caught some kind of stomach bug, is what I understood. But um, but he still clearly was playing for a win today. So here he makes the move h6, and you know the, the the thing when you watch Fabiano's games is sometimes it seems like he doesn't do anything special, like his moves are all somewhat natural, but clearly he's, he's unbelievably strong because he manages to outplay his opponents from from nothing, and so. This, you would still think, is uh, potentially, you know, a, a, a position that would end up being a draw fairly quickly. But I think black is already to be preferred because they have more space. The bishop against the knight is, is, is probably a slightly better piece. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I just think there's no, there's, there's no chance that white will ever be better. Black could be better. Um, I actually think that here it might have been an interesting moment to, to try to make... If you're looking to make a draw, then the move knight e5 maybe makes sense. Um, to, with the idea that, you know, if bishop takes g2, then there's knight takes d7, and you win material. Um, however, you know, I think black can still maybe try to be a little bit better. Bishop a8, you could actually take with the rook too. I mean, I think if white is looking to make a draw, then this is maybe the moment to, to try. Rook takes, bishop takes, and maybe black is still slightly to be preferred, but I would think this is just going to be a draw. So, so he plays knight d2, and now... Within a few moves, I think it becomes quite clear that bl only black has winning chances. Um, knight e4, I think, maybe was not the best move, but because he runs into f5. Um, but it's hard, it's hard to really find a plan for white, right? Like, white is kind of just sitting. Um, maybe he could make some useful pawn move on the king side, like maybe h4 would have helped. Maybe I mean, I know the computer sometimes likes to play f3. That seems not like a very human move because it just creates a a hole on e3. Um, but he played king g1, again, not much to do. f5, knight c3, knight e5. Uh, and now Fabiano starts to play very, like, sort of concrete, um, concretely for, for, for kingside, uh, kingside pressure and kingside grabbing space. Um, and, uh, and so Artemia feels like he's got to do something, so he plays knight f3, which induces this trade. And I don't think that black was really much better here. Um, but um, but he makes it look actually fairly easy. And, and now in just a few moves, it gets to be um, uh, significantly worse for, for white. And so we'll just go through quickly to another key moment. So in this position, black has clearly made progress. They provoked the pawn to b3 by moving the queen to e5. So now this pawn is a target. Um, and here, I think black is already starting to be uh, well on top. Um, <clears throat> so in this position, king g6, so he protects g5 so that he's threatening to take on b3. Uh, queen d1, he plays c4, which is very logical. He's, you know, of course, this pawn can't take because the, the knight is hanging. Um, he gets out of the pin so that he can play f3. But surprisingly, black, black makes a very, very natural move that wins a pawn but it seems like it was it was a mistake, and it's it's hard to it's hard to resist the way that Fabiano played. It seems like there was a very strong continuation here, which involved playing rook f4, f3. So f3 is almost forced because now we're threatening we're really threatening to take on d3. So f3 and c3, and so creating a pass pawn this way instead of taking on d3, the pawn is actually much stronger. Um, and then the main idea is actually to return with a rook rook f8 and either rook h8 or rook b8. 
and try to come to either B2 or H2, and the position is really hard. I tried different things, and against the computer, it's almost impossible to hold here. Um, however, Fabiano made the very natural move, bishop a7. Uh, the idea is he simply wants to take, but it turns out that if white had played, f3 was a good move, pawn takes d3. It turns out that if white had played a, as simple a move as queen d2, instead of queen a1, which he played, uh, it actually looks like he can hold this position. Um, moves like rook c8, I'm sure, is why he didn't play it, but after rook c1, simply, rook takes, queen takes, and even though you have a passed pawn here, it's basically uh, impossible to to do much. Part of the problem is that the king is so exposed that in a lot of lines the, the queen comes in. So for example, bishop d4, queen b1. It's also hard to to, to get the bishop to support the pawn. So um, for example here, if you return to a7, queen b2, now there's queen f6 check that's being threatened. And you know on e5 there's queen d2, then we attack g5. It just seems like this position actually kind of peters out to a draw. You can manage queen trades, but even these queen trades now are just uh, are just equal. The black king, uh, sorry, the white king can just come to e1 and d2, and eventually um, white will just win the pawn back. The king is too far away. So it seems like Artemiev missed sort of a chance here. Instead, after c takes d3, play queen a1, and then after bishop e3, um, now he's 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 starting to be in trouble. He actually probably still could try to hold by just sit, sitting still. But now he really blunders. Uh, rook d1, you know, changes the position from maybe clearly worse, but not not losing to just completely lost now after queen c4. Um, the queen is coming to c2 check with uh, great effect. There's some mating nets on the white king. Uh, he plays queen c3, and I think he must have missed here that after queen a2, knight d2. There's a very very strong move, queen c2, and now uh, now he's forced to sort of desperately sacrifice a piece and. Uh, the rest, the rest is quite easy. I mean, it looks, it looks like there might be a perpetual, but it's never. It's actually quite clear that there isn't. You just walk the king up the board, and at some point, if you can find a way to block with the bishop, then there's a discovered check that will win. So eventually, he walks his king up um, to b2, and now there's bishop b4 check, and the game ends. Hard to create a perpetual when there's like three pieces that can uh, that can block. So next move, black can just take on f3, uh, if nothing else. So Fabiano really concluding this tournament in amazing fashion. Uh, his rating is he's getting to 28, 41, or 42, uh, which is almost as high as he has ever been. And that was already all of five years ago, which seems kind of crazy to think about that it was that long ago. Um, but yeah, he is, um, you know, he's, he's just had a monster tournament going into the candidates. He's probably going to be the fate well i think he has to be considered the favorite for the candidates um let's take a look quickly i want to show you the magnus game so magnus finished with a draw definitely a little bit of a disappointing result for him it was just kind of funny that in this position so wesley so really played with no particular ambition today you know in e4 e5 he played the four knights and then just went for a line that trades everything um and it seems like a you know, maybe white has a tiny edge, but uh, of course something that Magnus would hold easily. Now in this position though, it, it was quite, obviously Magnus could just play rook takes a2, and then Wesley would play here, take this pawn, and agree to a draw. Um, but Magnus actually tried to win this position, which is which is amazing, and he just played king f6. And to be fair, I mean, he he did create almost a semblance of chances. It seems like the the combination of f and h pawn is better than the blocked a pawn. Uh, but it was never really in doubt that at some point uh, white can just try to give their pawn back and reach a, a drawn position. So um, this game ended in a draw. Uh, there was I wanted to point out the Anish Giri game for for the uh, supremacy among the Dutch was uh, was interesting. Uh, they both said that they were basically out of books. So this starts as an exchange slav. I, I guess I can start from move one. Um, it's an exchange Slav, uh, but an unusual variation. So the, the more typical variations go instead of bishop b5, bishop g5 would go knight c3, knight f6, and now either bishop f4 or knight f3. Uh, but you know lines go like this, and then now you can play e3 or knight f3. Um, and they're symmetrical, but uh, symmetrical white you know has a tiny bit of a pull because of the extra tempo. And sometimes actually chances chances to play for an attack on the king side. But anyway, in this game, 
Anish sort of looking for a fight, and these are two players that know each other very well. They're both, you know, they both uh, are Dutch and probably have worked together some amount. So he um, he decides to play Bishop G5 first, and there are some games with this, but it's a lot less uh, a lot less theory. Black uh, Black gets doubled pawns in exchange for the bishop pair, and it's just a fight. I, I don't know that either side has a has an edge in the opening, but it's a a pretty complex, you know, strategical position that can get messy as well. King h1 is to sidestep uh, the idea of playing f4. Um, but I'll go through it quickly. It's a, it's a complicated game, but there was one particular moment that caught my attention way later. So we can see it got got complicated. Black sacrificed a pawn, but here has what I would call, you know, it's great compensation um, in the form of, first of all, a passed c pawn. That's a very strong pawn. Uh, this b4 pawn is weak, and then they have two bishops against two knights, which is a double-edged sword because, you know, the, the knights could get squares, and, and the black king is not quite as safe. Um, and here, I think Jordan could have actually tried uh, to play f6. And uh, and it's still a very interesting position, but I, I feel like he's got to be not worse here. Um, and... Um, and yeah, it would have been interesting. There's different. There's a lot of different variations here. You could try d5. The computer kind of likes that move, but I think that this end game, you know, with the two bishops and a passed pawn, at least I, I would be, uh, I would be happy to to play this for Black. I don't think Black is in any danger of losing this. Um, but d5 probably not the move that that Anish would play. He might play something like rook e1. Uh, but again, you know, now it's now it's possible maybe to take on b4 and. Um, Knight d5, queen b7. We have a. This is a mess. This this is definitely a mess on the board. But but I feel like Black's chances are definitely not worse. So I think f6 would have been an interesting try. Otherwise, you know, Anish might have had a slight pull before. But uh, here, you know, Jordan played rook e8, and then he really had to to figure out how to defend. But he managed to defend uh, this end game, which you know he went for kind of willingly. Um, I would have been scared to go into this. Um, but he manages to make a draw. He started with a very key move, rookie two, and it's an odd position because even though um, White can at various points, you know, go and take the h7 pawn, um, Black is actually okay because you can never, you can never actually go into the rook end game. I'll show you why. So if we do this here, rook takes d8, c3, and now Black is actually winning, uh, even though White is up two pawns. For example, uh, I guess rook d1, c2, rook c1, rook d2. And the rook comes to d1, and so it's winning for black. Um, so kind of an amazing position. And I don't know how far he saw that this would be okay, but like, like the intuition is is that, you know, letting the rooks double on the seventh first and take a pawn with check and be up two pawns is going to be winning. But rook e2 uh, that he just played is a very strong defensive move. So Anish tried to play uh, a little bit differently. He took this pawn this way. But now in this case, even though he's up two pawns, again, it's it's hard because with the rook on the seventh, he can never really escape with this rook without allowing mate. And in other positions, you know, the rook gets to d2. I didn't see, actually didn't see a way for him to really fight, you know, beyond what he did. Um, and uh, even though he's up two pawns, he really couldn't find anything. So, um, yeah, this, I, this position is, is just a draw. I think that's pretty clear. Um, so Jordan, you know, finish, finishes the tournament in, in really a, in a happy way for him, drawing with Black against his his uh, his uh, colleague from from Holland. Um, and yeah, what other game? I was looking at the uh, the Dubov um, Dubov Firuja game, which is I guess what we call now the well, it's the London system. Of course, an opening that Magnus has played uh, many many times, and uh, in particular, this variation with Knight D2 was sort of a Magnus uh, a Magnus invention. And, um, you know, there's all sorts of sac pawn sacrifices here with queen b6. Like, so queen b6, the theory goes pawn takes c5, and then it's possible to take on c5, but queen takes b2. And then there's a lot there's a lot of variations that are quite complicated. Um, but in this game, it's interesting just to follow, instead of queen b6, uh, Dubov plays knight h5, which is a pretty unusual move. And it's it's Dubov is sort of becoming known as the openings guy uh, in, on the circuit. So... When he plays a move that has not been played too much, it's interesting. Uh, the computer at first doesn't like this move very much. So pawn takes e5, definitely the testing, the only real test. Knight takes f4, pawn takes f4. And now Dubov plays uh, a new move, uh, g6. 
And so I thought it was interesting enough to, to look at. Um, and I think white could have tried, so c3 makes a lot of sense just because the bishop is coming to g7, so we got to do something about the pawn on b2. But here he played bishop b5, I think knight b3 um, is what I would like to try if white is going to try to be better. Uh, knight b3 looks like the move to me, uh, sort of cementing this pawn. Instead, uh, Ali Reza played bishop b5, and after uh, castles, castles, d4, this is what knight b3 would prevent, by the way. Knight b3, of course, protects the c5 pawn, but also covers the d4 square. So in the same, if we have the same position, but just with the knight on b3 and white not having castle, d4 uh, would just be taken. And so here um, it sort of simplifies a lot into just a drawn position. It seems like maybe both players were not that excited to play today. Uh, understandably, you know, it's a very long... Wake on Day being a 13-round tournament, it's, it's definitely long. Some, some tournaments are nine rounds. This is a, a long one. Um, and after c6, they agreed to a draw because pawn takes, bishop takes, bishop a6. Maybe bishop f5 is okay, too. Um, and for example, bishop takes rook, bishop takes rook. Uh, and let's say king takes, rook takes. And this is just going to be a equal position. You know, still, uh, some people might like to play this with white, but, you know, maybe not on the... Maybe not in the final day, just because their rook is going to be very active. But I understand that uh, it was not the mood that Ali Reza was in was in today. Um, so uh, Wake on Zay was sort of a tale of two tournaments for Ali Reza. Right, he was leading at the beginning and seemed to be, you know, in contention to win the tournament. Uh, and that's when uh, the the tide turned. Right, that that critical round was where he lost, and then Fabiano won this crazy game against Anand that we looked at yesterday and, you know, was looked at by, by others, of course, as well. And, uh, and yeah, so then Fabiano, and, I, you know, I'm showing his, his uh, picture here, happily winning the tournament, um, is, uh, is starting the year, starting the year with a bang. You know, his rating is, is, is getting to be really, really high again. And he was just impressive. I mean, he won the last four games. It seemed like they were kind of easy. Um, so really, really impressive, uh, really impressive chess from him and um, and yeah very interesting for him going into the candidates um, so I'm gonna keep this brief today because you know I understand that it is uh, it is the uh, you know the last day of a long tournament and everyone knew who was gonna win today so that there's no point uh, going too too long here uh, but we have a lot coming you know in the US and North America in general we're gonna cover a lot of tournaments uh, it's not always going to be me by myself. I intend to have uh, a lot of guests with me and uh, some some exciting ones. I'll, I'll uh, they'll remain nameless until until it actually happens. But I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, this tournament was you know free for everyone to view. Uh, but I you know I strongly recommend considering a premium membership uh, to get access to all these video series, including the one that Magnus just uh, came out with. It's you know Magnus talking to you about chess for several hours from his living room, you know, something that is, of course, hard to find anywhere else. Uh, but also some of our tournaments, you know, will uh, will probably require premium membership to, to view the broadcast. We have a, an incredible team in Europe with uh, Jan Gustafsson heading things up. Uh, Laurent Fressinet doing French content. Obviously, uh, as you guys have probably guessed, if you didn't know, French is my first language. I'm probably going to do a few things in French, maybe with Laurent, maybe with other people as well. Uh, but yeah, we have a lot of exciting things going on, so I, I, I hope you continue to follow us on Chess24 or on one of our you know, social media channels. And, uh, and yeah, it's been a pleasure. This is Grandmaster Pascal Charbonneau. I will also leave you with our um, Chessable course. Uh, you know, Ch Chessable is part of the, the, the umbrella that, that Chess24 is a part of. Um, they have proprietary um, technology called Move Trainer which the Move Trainer, you know, allows you to, to learn uh, and uses AI to, to figure out what you sort of need to see again and what you've mastered already. Uh, so I recommend you check that out. And thank you for tuning in, and I will speak to you all soon.